that the Lord has made, we shall rejoice and be glad. And if you're, if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, come on, make some noise in the room. Come on, let's stand to our feet and let's begin to worship our Father, our King. Come on. Come on, clap your hands around the room. Hey. Come on, sing this song with me tonight. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of just when I ran, I ran, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Oh, you picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name. Savior, I thank God. Come on, come those hands around the room. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. So I cannot deny what I say. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning. Like ashes in the wind. Yeah, yeah. I said so long to my old friends. But you need to keep it moving. You got to tell him you're not welcome here. Yeah. Now till I walk the streets of gold, I sing of how you saved my soul. This way was so, I found this way back. Oh, oh, oh. Because he healed my heart, my heart changed my name, forever free. Forever free. I'm, I'm not the same. same. I thank the master. I thank the savior. Oh, I, I thank God. God. Hey, words come out. We have so much to be thankful for. So we're gonna rejoice in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Come on, this is our testimony. We lost another one. I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. Yeah. You are free, yeah. yes we are free. Come on, say it. Hell lost, lost another, another one, one. I, am free. Yeah, I am free. I am free, I am free. I am free. The hell lost another hell one. Lost another one. I yes, I am free. I am free. I am free. I am free. Come on, hell lost another hell one. Lost another one. I am free. Just hell up to another one. We are. Yes, I am free. I am free. Come on, say. Hell up to another one. Yes, I am free. Yes, I am free. Say, hell up to another one. Yes, I am free. Yes, I am free. Come on, say. Because he picked me up. scripture that says though your tears may last for a night joy comes in the morning that's what I'm thankful for today tear you might have cried last night but there's joy in the house of the Lord this morning 
So whether you're in person or online, you're in Ohio, you're celebrating your birthday in California, you're in the right spot. We get to celebrate the Lord today, celebrate all that he is doing. And so whether it's your first time or you've been coming for a little bit, we want to get to know you and we have a gift for you. So fill out the connect card. You can meet Elena, Daniel, Tracy. We could, I could introduce to anybody, um, but we want to get you a gift so we can tell you a little bit about us and we get to know a little bit more about who you are. Um, but yesterday, I wanted to share this quick story. It was just a beautiful day yesterday. Um, I got a new bike, everybody. That's exciting. And so thank you. Yes. Uh, but I got a new bike, and we put a trailer on the bike for, for our three-year-old Isla. And I was, I was riding the bike, and she was like, go faster. And I was like, don't, you can't tell me what to do. But I, was, I literally said, Isla, my legs hurt. I'm going as fast as I can. And then, and then we got home, and Emily, my wife, was like, Isla, how did it go? She was like, ugh, my legs hurt. And I literally had this thought, I carried you the whole time. I carried you the whole time. And I had this thought that I could give God anything and he's going to carry it the whole time. That's why that scripture I shared at the beginning is so encouraging because those tears that, that they may last for a night, joy comes in the morning. I could give God my tears. You could give God your weakness. You could give God your bad week. But joy is here today. And so that's why we get to be thankful for all that he is doing. And so we are uh, we're going to keep worshiping together. But let's do this. We have a lot of people up in the balcony. So balcony people, you could wave to the people down below. People down below, say hello. And we're going to continue to worship together. Father, you're great. And you're greatly to be praised. The word says his greatness is unsearchable. It's so vast that no one can know its end. And so, Lord, we just worship you in awe of you. voice we lift it up. It's your breath in our land so far. So we pour out our prayers. Presence your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our breath to you only. Oh, he's 
says it's comely that is a beautiful thing you have to know that worship is so important to God the word said that when he created the earth the angels worshiped every day 24 7 all of creation every single thing that God made joins in one large you can say cosmic orchestra a chorus day and night in adoration and in honor of God amen one of my favorite revelations about worship, it says that prayer brings you into heaven's atmosphere. And so if you want to go into the scene where God is, then you should pray. But if you want him to come where you are, and if you want him to surround you right where you are, I don't know about you, but I need him everywhere that I go. And if his presence is not there, I don't want to go. Don't even send me. Your presence matters more to me than an oath. And so if you want God to come to where you are, you better worship. Psalm 22 and 3 says, He inhabits the praises of His people. And that praise is an unrehearsed, spontaneous song right from your lips to the heart of God. And so whatever He is to you, whatever He has done for you, I am going to invite us to lift it up in worship, to exhort loudly in worship, for the Lord loves to hear what He means to us. You may say, I don't know what to say. I dare you to just take a breath in and take a breath out. The very breath that we breathe is the breath of life that God is breathing to us. Oh, so we can lift it up in the name of Jesus. Come on and lift up a prayer. Come on, who is he to you? Is he healer? Lift it up. Is he father? Lift it up. Is he savior? Lift it up. Oh, Father, you are all creator. Everything joins in worship to you of the air, the clouds, the trees and their branches, the wind blowing, your sons and daughters, young and old men, women and children, lift up one large song to you, because you're worthy, worthy to receive glory and honor. 
I just feel like can we just sing this really fast? Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Everyone will bow down and say you are king. We might as well start right now. So let's start. Let's just do King of Glory. King of Praise just for you. You're all we, all we want. Come on, sing it one more time. King of Glory. Presence is our home. Just wanna be with you. Yeah. Cause in your presence, we've got a sure foundation. In your presence, we've got a joy unshakable. In your presence, we have all that we need, Lord. Smile. 
keep our feet firmly planted in the midst of a shaken world. to us and the peace that you give is a peace that sur surpasses and just transcends all of our human understanding the peace that gives us a firm foundation in the midst of tribulation here on earth in the midst of sorrow in the midst of trouble in the midst of grief in the midst of persecution the peace that you give keeps us firmly planted and guards our hearts and our you invite us on like this journey to go with you from faith to faith to faith. You direct our footsteps and you make them sure. You plant our feet firmly upon the rock that cannot be moved. And when the torrential rains fall, and when the floods arise, and when the stormy winds blow, we cannot be moved because we have an unshakable foundation. And that foundation is Christ. Christ is our firm foundation. So we just rest in assurance of your word. But I just feel that you also want us to just rest in assurance of your character and who you are. The God who promises is also faithful. That when the Lord sends his word forth, it will not fall to the ground. That when you speak a thing, when you decree a thing, you are well able to perform that thing. And you are well able to uphold your own word. Thank you for this foundation that we have. Thank you for we have something greater than a hope. We have a knowing. We have a faith. We have a firm foundation in you. You are so amazing. We are forever in awe. May your praise forever be on our lips. And always in our mouths. May a song always be in our hearts. Because you're worthy of all that we can give song, every lifted hand, our bow that we give, our shout, you're worthy of it all. And if you agree in Jesus' name, say amen. 
So what, before we transition, why don't we turn to our neighbors that we've been worshiping with all morning and just greet them, but also encourage them. Stay strong, because God will not fail. Amen. Go ahead and greet your neighbors. Welcome to church this morning. Every Sunday at New City, you can expect a powerful time of worship, a message from God's word, and an invitation to take steps towards experiencing a new life, a new way, and a new purpose through Jesus. And if you're joining us for the first time this morning, we would love to get to know you. Don't forget to stop by the Connect Corner out in the lobby after service. And if you're joining us online, you can always connect with any of our online hosts. Our team would love to give you a special gift, answer any questions that you might have, and introduce you to the people and the purpose of New City Church. Graduations are right around the corner. If you are a graduate from eighth grade, high school, college, or higher education, we wanna know and we wanna celebrate you next Sunday during our 10 a.m. service. You or your parents can go to our website and find a registration link with more information on how you can be included in this moment. You deserve to be celebrated. We have an exciting opportunity to serve as a church next week. We're partnering with Michelle Clark High School and Gonzalez Scholastic Academy to host end of the year celebrations for their students, their faculty, and their families. Convoy of Hope is bringing an entire semi-truck to be a part of these exciting events. You can serve and be a part of this outreach in a couple of different ways. You can help sort and prep supplies in advance at Oak Brook Community Church on Thursday, June 9th, or you can help host the celebrations on June 10th or 11th at the schools. You pick the day and the way that you'd like to serve. And for more information, you can go to newcity.life. James 1.27 says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Another way that this passage could be understood is worship. Worship that is pure and genuine in the sight of God expresses itself through the generous act of caring for the less fortunate. A life devoted to worship is a life devoted to those in affliction. One of the purest demonstrations of the gospel is to move towards hard places and broken people, not away from them. We are so fortunate and blessed to be a part of a church that is filled with people who embody the heart of worship that this passage is describing. It's only because of your generosity that we get to take care of the orphans, the widows, and those in affliction. There are three easy and simple ways for you to give to New City and to support this work. You can give through our app, on our website, or by texting a dollar amount to the number at the bottom of the screen. Thank you, New City, for your generosity. No matter what you're walking through today, God has your back. So let's open our hearts now to hear from Him. We love you, New City, and we're so glad you're here. Have a great Sunday. Welcome to week three of our We Are City, New City Church. How are we feeling today? That was okay, but I don't know if you were sitting in the same worship service I was sitting in, but I could literally go home right now. I'm so blessed right now. How are we feeling today? Can we give God some praise? 
I know what you're thinking. You're like, Pastor Steve, you're shorter. No, that's not true. That's not what's going on. Pastor Steve's not here today. Today's actually Jesse's birthday, um, and he's off celebrating Jesse's birthday. So do me a favor. If you have her number, can you just spam her right now? Like, and I want you to be like just obnoxious with it, like happy send, birthday send, I send, love send, you send. Like do that. If you follow her on social media, tag her. Let her know how much you love her. See, see, here's the thing. Pastor Steve gets a lot of credit, and 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 it's and it's like it's due to him. All the work and the and the, and the preparation and all that that he does on a weekend and week out basis, so we could be the church that we are. It's amazing, but not a lot of people get to see all the sacrifices that Jesse makes for this church. Um, she's on her knees for this church. She's she's discipling for this church. She's she's helping behind the scenes for this church. And so I'm so grateful that I get to do life with people like Pastor Steve and Jesse. And so can we do something real quick? Because I have a hunch that even though they're not here today, they're probably tuning in. So I'm going to count to three. And as loud as you can, can you just say happy birthday, Jesse? Is that cool, everybody? Good? All right. So, so we're going to do it one time as loud as we can. Ready? One. Two, three. Happy Jesse. Jesse, if you're watching, we love you. We miss you. We hope you are enjoying your time. Um, man, I'm so blessed to be here today. Um, we're in the middle of this series called We Are. Um, and by the way, my name is, is, is Joaquin. In case it's your first time here, I'm on the pastoral team here at New City Church. I'd love to get the opportunity to meet you after service at the Connect Center. So if you're here for the first time, please come say hi. Um, we are in the middle of a series called We Are, where we're talking about some principal ideas that make New City, New City. And on week one, Pastor Steve spoke about Jesus is our message. Uh, last week, he spoke about people are our heart. Now try saying that ten times fast. People are our heart. And um, it is my assignment today to talk about hope. Hope is our foundation. And I don't know about you, but um, it, it's, it's not very difficult to, to, to notice when we turn on the news media, when, when we have discussions with friends and family that, that there seems to be a lack of hope in our society. And, and it's not hard to tell why the, 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 the devastation, the, the horrific acts that are happening around the world. And as I was praying and preparing for this message, I just, I just, I, I really sensed really strongly in my heart that it's not just the world that needs hope, but I believe the, 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 the children of the Lord, the, the body of believers need a reminder of what is our hope and what is it connected to. So um, as it's custom in this church to stand for the reading of God's word, can I, can I just ask you to stand for a moment here? If you're following along, I'll be reading from the book of John chapter number 20. So if you have your Bibles, you can light them up and swipe to that chapter. Um, verse 24, so, so some context here. Um, Jesus just died. Uh, he was buried and, and now he's resurrected and the disciples just don't know what to do. They, they are just in disarray. They are confused. They're alone. They're, they're doubting. They're in a state of disbelief and despair and lack of hope. Um, and uh, the dis Jesus decides to show up to the disciples, and he's like, hey, I, I, I'm here. And the disciples have this powerful moment of seeing Jesus right there in the flesh, right in front of them, after they just witnessed the horrific act of the crucifixion just days before, and, and now he's here in the flesh and, and all that. The, the problem is, is that someone was missing. Look to your neighbor and say, someone was missing. Now nah, I'm going to need you all to participate with me. Don't leave me hanging up here today. Say, say, someone was missing. Thomas, the disciple, wasn't there when Jesus showed up. So then the disciples come and they rush to Thomas and they say, Thomas, we saw our Lord. We saw Jesus. And Thomas is like, stop playing games with me, Peter. You play too much. And then he's like, I won't believe it. Not even if I see it with my own, own eyes. I have to touch him in order to see it. That's where we're picking up. So verse 24 says this, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when, the, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, 
I will never believe. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28, then Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Let me pray. Father, we come before you, God, and we thank you for this time. Lord, we need hope. And we need you to move in our hearts and in our minds and in this world and in our culture, Father God, more than ever before, God. And so today, God, I pray, God, that we would lean into this message and allow you to do the work that you want to do on the inside of us, oh God. So Lord, what we know not, would you teach us? What we have not, would you give us? And what we are not, God, would you make us, God? In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Uh, you, can, you can be seated here, you can be seated. Um, I don't know how Pastor Steve preaches every week for 25 minutes without a glass of water. That is impressive. I think I was about, I was about nine or ten years old when I made the biggest decision in my life. I'm not even exaggerating. To give you some context, here's what happened. See, I was born, I, I, I know I may not look like this, but I was not born here. I was born in Colombia. I'm actually 100% Colombia. I know, I know. I was, I asked my mom all the time, like, hey, you sure there wasn't, like, a testimony that you want to share with me or anything like that. But no, like, it's, it's, it's in my family tree. I am 100% Colombian. We speak Spanish. You know, I'm all up in that culture. And here's the thing about Colombians. We love soccer. Any, any fans of soccer in the room? Yep. Okay, cool. Love it. So, so we love soccer. And here's the thing. When I was born, my dad did not give me any other option. As soon, before I was even able to walk, he would, he would carry me himself put a soccer ball there in front of me and just start, like, just doing that. You know that little baby thing you do? Like, when you, like, you know, kind of short, you can kind of imagine it. Just I was a little shorter. And, and, and he gave me no other option. And, and, and here's the thing is that it's not just like we were fanatics and it's not just like my family was a fan of soccer. Like, we, we did the thing. You know what I mean? Like, my grandfather, he, pray, he played for the national team in Colombia. He played in the Olympics. My, my father himself played pro for a professional team in the city of Barranquilla in Colombia. And, and so, like, this was like, like, imagine the pressure I had on my shoulders at the age of nine months. I mean, it was a lot to carry on my shoulders. So, so, so this, is, this is just context, just to, like, so you understand what's going on here. So the, the problem is, is that my, dis, my dad decided to move here to the United States. And here in the United States, Although people love soccer, it's not necessarily like the main sport out here, especially where I grew up. I grew up in New York, Jamaica, Queens, in New York City. And, um, you know, the sport there is basketball. So my dad did his absolute best. He would wake me up, put me in leagues, and, and I would be playing. I wouldn't just play with my own age group either. Like, I, I had to play with the older kids. He was my coach. He was, you know make me do drills in the morning and all these things. He invested so much time, so much passion, so much energy in making sure I was set up to be the best soccer player to ever exist in the Pardo family. Like, that's my last name. Like, he did his absolute best to do that. And then I started making friends in, in school. And my friends would invite me to go play, and it's like, hey, Joaquin, we're going to go play after school. I would bring my soccer cleats. They would look at me like, are you dumb? Like, what, what is that? You can't play basketball with soccer cleats. And so they started teaching me this sport, and then they started showing it to me on the TV. And i never forget, I, I witnessed Tracy McGrady drop 61 points while he was on the Orlando Magics. And then that was all she wrote. I fell in love. I loved basketball. I was thinking about basketball. I started training basketball. I was working on my dribbling. I was working on my shooting. I taught, I taught Tommy Adams everything he knows, by the way. True story. And here's the thing is that I, I, I got to the place in school where they were having tryouts for two types of teams, the soccer team and the basketball team. It was impossible to play for both. 
Now, if I'm honest, I wasn't being outright, you know, honest with my dad. I, I wasn't letting him know what I was hiding. Like, I, I had, you know, I had like demons in my closet. I, I didn't want him to know that I was betraying his love for, for this new love I had in basketball. And so I, I, was, I was like rehearsing the speech while I was on my way back home uh, from school. And I'm like, how am I going to tell my dad? You would have sworn this was like the prodigal son story in, in, in the Bible. Like I'm trying to figure out what, like, what, how, what nuanced way I can say it that doesn't hurt his feelings. You know what I'm talking about? And then um, I finally get to my dad. I'm like, hey, daddy, um, I, uh, I, I don't want to play soccer anymore. And he looks outside and it was raining. He was like, yeah, I get it. It's raining. It's okay. And I'm like, mm. It's going to be harder than I thought. Um, and then I said, you know, uh, Dad, that's not what I mean. I mean, like, I don't want to play soccer this year. I want to play basketball instead. And he was like, Joaquin, no para tanto, que te pasa a ti? And I know y'all think he was speaking tongues. He wasn't. That was Spanish. And he was just, he was just, he was just literally, like, uh, upset. And he's like, what are you talking about? And, and then we're going back and forth. And it was actually a very passionate conversation and here's what happened what happened was is that my dad while I communicated this big news that was about to change the history of our family I'm pretty dramatic if you haven't like realized right now um, but what was happening in the moment was that my dad his heart was broken here's why his heart was broken his heart was broken because he invested so much time passion energy so much of his knowledge into me and then out of nowhere all of a sudden his reality didn't match up to his hope his hope was for me to be something and then the reality in front of him did not match his hope and so his heart was broken and here's the thing is that when I look around into the world, and I don't even have to look out to the world. Sometimes when I'm looking within the four walls of a church, you start to notice people walking around with a broken heart in their chest. And the reason they have this broken heart is because their hope doesn't align with their current reality. And that's the context of today's passage. Here we have Thomas, one of the disciples he has a broken heart. He's dealing with grief. He's, he's dealing with, with some anger. He's dealing with, with, with confusion. And he's dealing with pain all because what he hoped for doesn't seem to be happening. Now, to give you more context, um, at this point of, of history, Jesus just spent three years of his life with 12 men, the 12 disciples. Thomas was one of them. In those three years, Jesus spent his time teaching these men and, 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 and doing life with these men and teaching them about his word and, and teaching them about the things that were about to happen and including his death and his, his resurrection. Here's the thing about the three years, they weren't just filled with Jesus preaching sermons, but they were filled with a lot of sacrifice. They weren't just um, years filled with responsibilities, but they were years filled with deep relationships. They weren't just years filled with Jesus mentoring these men. No, 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 no. They were three years of these men witnessing the miraculous hand of Jesus at work firsthand. See, Jesus called the disciples to himself, including Thomas. But with that call came a cross to bear. I know that, number one, because Jesus says it. And then number two, it's because they went through everything together. I mean, they had highs and they had lows. They, 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 had, they had moments of great disbelief and then they had moments of astonishment. And the moments of disbelief usually came at the hand of fear, right? That makes sense. But then the moments of astonishment would usually come when they caught a a glimpse, a revelation of who Christ truly was. Now, a perfect example of this, by the way, is um, do you guys remember that story in the Bible where Jesus tells the disciples to get in the boat and cross to the other side? You remember that story? Well, they get on the boat and they, and they take heed to Jesus' word. And then out of nowhere, there's this big storm that just shows up. And it gets, it gets crazy. It's heavy winds and heavy waves and water's getting into the boat. And the boat begins to sink. And then one of the disciples comes downstairs looking for Jesus, scared for his life. And Jesus has the audacity to be sleeping at the bottom of the boat. Now this disciple looks at Jesus and he's like, hey, Jesus, your pillow is wet. He's like, I don't know if you noticed, but we're going, we're going down. 
And then he says something really interesting. He says, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care that our lives are at risk? Don't you care? Now, here's what's interesting about that phrase. I can relate to that phrase. That phrase is actually really familiar to me because I don't know about you, but there have been seasons and moments in my life where I have prayed that prayer. I have said, God, don't you care. I have a hunch today that there are people sitting in this room, sitting in the balcony, maybe tuning in online on Facebook, YouTube, maybe watching the playback, that you yourself can also relate to this prayer. You have prayed, God, don't you care. And you can fill in the blank. For him, it was, don't you care that we're going to drown? For you, it could be, God, don't you care that I'm overwhelmed? It could be, God, don't you care that I'm filled with anxiety? Don't you care that my marriage isn't the way it's supposed to be? God, don't you care that my kids aren't doing what they're supposed to do? God, don't you care that I just lost my job? God, don't you care that I'm going through this health issue? God, don't you care? Now, here's the thing. Here's the beauty behind that question is that this question, when we get to that place, it's an indicator of what's happening on the inside. It's, it's letting us know that something deep and profound is happening in here and in here. And, and it's revealing to us that our hearts are beginning to lose hope. I often find that the evidence of hope being lost is when we begin to question God's care for us. That's what's happening in the boat. One minute, they're questioning Jesus, asking if he even cares about their lives. And then in the next minute, they're astonished. One minute, it's, hey, God, do you care? The next minute, they're in awe. They witness Jesus standing up. He goes to the edge of the boat, raises his hand, tells the winds and the waves to cease, and the storm goes away. And then they're, they're, they're in full of amazement, astonishment. They're in awe. Now, remember what I said before, when this would happen to the disciples, when they would have that awe, that astonishment, it usually came because they got a revelation of who Christ was. Now, if you read the Old Testament scriptures, you're going to find tons of language around the idea that God himself is the only one who can control the winds and the waves and the storms and creation. So the reason they're in disbelief in one moment and in awe in the other is because out of nowhere they're kicking back and they're looking at Jesus do the very thing that only God can do. I just want to remind somebody in the room today that when you begin to lose hope, when you begin to, to grow sorrowful and, and you don't know what direction to turn and you're questioning God's care over your life, could you begin to remind yourself of who Jesus is? He's God himself. Could you remind yourself of the power, the wonder-working power that he has in the palm of his hands, at the tip of his tongue? That is what's happening with the disciples. They're in awe because they're connecting the pieces. They're like, this man that is in our boat is doing the only things attributed that God can do in the scriptures. This is God himself in our midst. God is in the midst of the storm with us. We're not alone. We're not alone. Faith and hope is built on this reality, on us witnessing God do the very things that he can do. When we lose hope, we can't forget who God is. That's usually the, the connection. That's usually what happens. We, we lose hope and then we forget everything that he's done. Now in today's text, I believe Thomas is the perfect picture and Tyler, you can start coming up to help me. Thomas is the perfect picture of someone who's had enough. Someone who has lost hope. Someone who finds himself in a hopeless situation. His soul is weary. His soul is literally saying, I've had enough. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. See, for Thomas, it's one thing to spend three years with Jesus. Side by side, it's another when he's spending three days alone by himself. See, they've had moments while they were together, by the way. Following Jesus wasn't all like happy days. They, they had moments where their lives were being threatened. They had moments where stones were being thrown at them. But, but the thing is that the attacks from the enemy feel different when you're with Jesus. I think the other way I could put it is 
It's easy to have hope in the presence of Jesus. It's impossible to have it outside of it. I have to make an important distinction when it comes to biblical hope. This may ruffle some feathers. Here's what biblical hope is not. It's not positive thinking. It's not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is not looking at the giant in front of you and saying he's not there. Biblical hope is not looking at that mountain that's standing before you off at a distance and saying that's, that's just an anthill. Biblical hope is not saying uh, um, this situation, even though it's really bad, it's not really bad, it's really good, it's really good, and I'm going to keep saying it until it happens. It's really good, it's really good, it's really good. That's not biblical hope. All throughout scriptures, you have people in the Bible that admit what's in front of them is too much to handle, but their hope is not in their current reality. Their hope is connected to the God that they serve. (laughs) Dr. R.C. Sproul says it this way. He says in his commentary of Romans, he says, hope is not taking a deep breath and hoping things are going to turn out all right. That's not hope. Hope is the assurance that God is always going to do what he says he will do. And here's why that's important for our text today. It's not like Jesus didn't tell the disciples this would happen. Jesus spent his life of ministry preparing them for the day that he was going to die, for the day he was going to be buried, and and preparing them for the day he was about to be resurrected. Matthew 17, 22 to 23, here's proof. Jesus says, as they were gathering Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. So it's not an issue of not knowing. That's not Thomas's issue. Thomas's issue is not taking God at his word. Allow me for a moment to point this mirror back this way. If I'm understanding the text correctly, what this means for us is that when we are going through our darkest and loneliest and scariest seasons of our lives, when we're confused and we're alone and we're afraid, we have the tendency to think it's because we don't know what lies ahead. But if we allow the weight of the text to do its job, it's informing us that although that may be something that pops up, that's not the root issue. You you lost your job, you you lost a relationship, you're you're struggling in your finances, your your marriage is in trouble. Your issue is actually not knowing the future. Your issue is not taking God at his word. And I just... I literally feel like my assignment today is to ask the question, what has God said? When you think about your situation, when you look at the world that we're we're in, what has God said? When you're thinking about what's next, when you don't know what decisions to make, what has God said? When you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling anxious, what has God said? How do we take God as, at his word? We, we hold on to his word. Are you feeling anxious? Take him at his word. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Are you feeling weak? Are you feeling in need of help? Take him at his word. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge. God is our strength of very present help. In times of trouble. Are you intimidated by what's in front of you and you feel like you can't overcome it? Take him at his word. Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hope grows when you take him at his word. His words are filled with so much purpose. Every time Jesus spoke to the disciples, he was giving them purpose and he was giving them clarity. The moment they they lost sight of purpose, they lost sight of hope. 
God has a distinct purpose for your life. The moment you lose sight of that, you lose sight of hope. When you begin to do that, when you begin to hold on to the hope that God makes available to you through his word, through his person, you do begin to look at your situations differently. And it's not the positive thinking way or the wishful thinking way I described before, but you do begin to look at it and remind your situation of who your God is. You're able to look at that giant and say, hey, this is a mighty giant in front of me. It's not a mighty giant for my God. You begin to look at that mountain and say, that's a pretty tall mountain, but it's not an anthill to me, but it's an anthill to my God. You begin to look at your stress and your worries and your burdens and say, this is heavy for me, but it's not heavy for my God. Why is it not heavy for my God? The only reason I know that is because he took the time to reveal himself to me through the scriptures and I can hold on to this word every single day that I live. And even though I turn on the media and even though I, I get on social media and turn on the the news and everything that's happening out there points to death and destructions. I can be a light. I could be a light in the midst of all of that because God has already spoken. He's already spoken. Doubting Thomas. That that's the name that people give him. Doubting Thomas. I don't know why he gets such a bad rap. I'm so grateful his story is in the Bible. If he's doubting Thomas, then I'm doubting Joaquin. Because there have been too many situations in my life where God has already spoken. God has already told me what I need to hold on to. And I refuse to do it because I'm just so afraid of what is in front of me. I forget to remind myself of the power and the, and the wonder work and miraculous touch of my God. I, I forget these things and I begin to doubt what God has already said. I don't know who I'm talking to in the room, but stop doubting what God has already spoken over you. If he's spoken, it will happen. It will happen. I'm talking to parents that have stopped praying for their children because you're just afraid. If he spoke it, it will happen. Keep praying. I'm talking to people that are scared to literally hold on to the things that God is calling them to do. You're, you're afraid to take that step. Take that step because if he said it, it will happen. Thomas was in such a state of disbelief that he says, I, it's not even about seeing him. I mean, think about the traumatic experience that Thomas went through. He spent three years with his Lord and Savior, and then he witnesses him being hung on a tree and gruesomely killed. Nails in his hands and nails in his feet and crowns of thorns in his head. Thomas must be thinking, I know Jesus said this, but nobody can come back from that. So he's like, it's not about seeing him. I got to, I got to touch, I got to touch him. I got to witness it firsthand. Doubting Thomas. I'm so grateful for your story. But I'm even more grateful of the God that we serve, of the Savior that we have. Because if it was me and I spent three years of my life telling my disciples, this is what's going to happen. Peter, this is what's going to happen. Thomas, this is what's going to happen. And I go through everything I, do, I done went through and I come back and I'm resurrected. I'm in this body and I'm like, death thought it won and it didn't win and I'm here now. And I go see my disciple. I would be expecting a, ah, we were waiting for you. We knew you could do it. Yeah, my God, you, Jesus. That's what I would have been expecting, but that's not the reality of the text. Jesus shows up and his disciples are confused more than ever. If it was me, I would have been like, I would have hit him with something like my dad would, I know para tanto. Go over there with that. I done told you this was going to happen. But I'm so happy that that's, <laughs> I wasn't called to be the savior of the world. Jesus is the savior of the world because his response is that he shows up to the disciples and then he shows up again. And he doesn't even ask Thomas any questions. He doesn't say, why did you doubt? Did you not believe me? 
I'm so grateful Jesus is not intimidated by our doubts. There are people that are trying to suppress their doubts. Don't suppress your doubts. Confess your doubts. God can handle them. There are people that are scared to answer questions that family members have because they, they doubt. Don't be afraid of the doubt. Jesus can handle the doubt. He goes to Thomas and say, Thomas, look, put your, put your hand right. Put your hand right there. Obviously, this was pre-COVID. <laughs> I played too much. Here, take your, take your hand. Put it, put it right here. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He has his revelation. Here's why he has his revelation. Is because now he's connected to the source of his hope. See, when we... We have to be careful not to get caught up in the world's rhetoric of what the solutions and the answers are. We have to be very careful. Our, our call is distinctly different. Our hope is not in a policy. It's not in a government. It's not in a song. It's not in a thing. It's not in a preacher. It's not in a setting. It's in a person, and that person is Jesus. That is our source of hope. If we're not connected to Jesus, then, then all hope is lost. But if we have that connection to Jesus, if we spend time with Jesus, if we honor his presence and we say, God, would you fill me, and I want to meet with you today, those are the moments that our hope begins to rise like never before and that's what happens to Thomas as the worship team makes their way on stage I don't know what season of life you're in at the moment I don't know what storm you may be facing I don't know what winds are in your way I don't know what waves are crashing into your boat I don't know what insecurities you may have I don't know what worries you're dealing with I don't know what's in front of you, but I know who stands before you. That's Christ, our beautiful Savior. So I want to pray in two ways. The first way, I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. Because maybe you're in the room today and you would say, Pastor Joaquin, I, I, I definitely don't have this source of hope. I may have been in the things of Jesus and I may have been in the environment, but, but I myself have never had this relationship, this encounter with, with Jesus, this one-on-one -on -one experience with Jesus where he is my hope and, and I want him to be my source of hope. I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. If that's you, I just simply want to pray for you. Could you just slip up a hand and just put it right down? I see you. Just slip up a hand and put it down. I see you, brother. I'm going to wait one more moment. It's one thing to go to church. It's, it's another thing to actually know Christ. So if that's you, just slip up a hand and put it down. If you lift it up your hand, can you just repeat this prayer with me? Actually, church... Just, just for comfort, can, can we just repeat this prayer all together? Say, say, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Today, I give my life to you. Have your way in my life, in my mind, and in my soul. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's, here's, how I, here's how I feel led to close today. Our world is in desperate need of hope. Would you agree? And we're the church. We are the ones that point to the ultimate source of hope. But the reality is, is that there are stormy conditions out there. So I want us to stand together if that's okay. The team's gonna lead us back into that song and I want us to truly, just for a moment, it's just gonna be a couple moments and then we'll dismiss, but I want us to pray, I want us to worship, give God the glory he deserves, confess that the winds come, the rains come, but our hope is set on him. So can we stand, can we begin to lift up our hands, can we open up our own mouths?
Can we confess to Jesus that he's our source of hope? Team, would you lead us? Whatever you're dealing with, you're going to make it through. Yes. Whatever's in front of you, you're going to make it through. Yes. It's one thing for me to believe it for you. It's another thing for you to believe it for yourself. You're going to make it through. Whatever obstacle, whatever's in the way, you're going to make it through. I'm being repetitive on purpose because there's so many voices that come into our mind on a daily basis, coming from every single outlet. I'm here to remind you today that your source of hope is sitting on the throne in heaven and that is the only reason I have the confidence to say that you're going to make it through. So Father, we come before you and we thank you, God. We thank you for what you did over 2,000 years ago, oh God. And Lord, even in this room right now, whatever situation may be present, God, we say you are Lord over that situation, oh God. God, you, you, you have strength over that giant, over that mountain, God. Lord, you are able and you are capable to do the unthinkable, to do the thing that only you can do, oh God. Lord, we pray for our world out there, oh God. So broken, oh God. So evil, oh God. And we say, would you have your way, God? Would you give your church the courage and the boldness to proclaim your gospel message, to point to the only source of hope that we truly have, oh God. God, for the parent that is praying for the children, God, would you come through for them, oh God. Would you show them they're going to make it through, oh God. God, for the, for the single mom, the single parent that's struggling right now, oh God, would you remind them even in the midst of your presence right now, God, that they're going to make it through, oh God. For the businessman whose business isn't doing what it's supposed to do, God, would you show him that they're going to make it through, Father God. Whoever is in the room right now, sickness and disease, God, they all have to bow to you anyway, oh God. Yeah. So in our times of trouble, in our times of need, would you remind our souls that we're going to make it through, oh God. For the Christian who's been coming to church and haven't, they haven't been able to feel anything, God. Would you restore to them the joy of their salvation, oh God. Because without hope there is no joy. Without joy there is no hope, oh God. God, we are grateful. We are grateful for your grace and your mercy that you would you would come into our section and not be mad at us but you would address our doubts and say touch me here and touch me here so father we love you and we thank you and we trust you and we say our hope is in you in Jesus name we pray amen amen and amen Church, we love you. The, the team will play something on the way out, but if it was your first time here, I'd love to connect with you for a second. I'll be in the connect corner. We have Bibles if you need a Bible. We got free coffee beans if you're into that as well, but I'd love to get to know you. We'll see you next week for week four. Pastor Steve will be back. We love you and have a great weekend.